Hello, the enemy inside. I'm trying so incredibly hard not to be angry with what is on display all around us. As I wrote last week, it is very difficult to understand how some people believe what they believe. These beliefs are explicit or implicit expressions of hatred that are now threatening and actually killing more and more innocent people. To say the least, my emotions are running on fumes. There are two thoughts primarily reverberating in my soul right now. I might double click on them in future posts. The first is a growing feeling that we are fighting the wrong war. The second is that the main war is actually inside our own minds. In that sense, we indeed have met the enemy and he is us. To take a cue from the 1812 Perry quote made famous by this pogo comic strip published for Earth Day in 1971. At least here in the US, our politics are severely broken. Our two main ideologies and the people that support them are pushing one another further and further apart through tactics that are dehumanizing, destabilizing, and debilitating. In this game, there are no winners. Both sides lose. Bearing witness to the wars brewing farther away, it must be clear to anyone that the differences between the aspirations of Democrats and Republicans are nothing compared to the difference between a life lived in Tel Aviv versus Tehran or Miami versus Moscow. It's about time to direct our attention to where the real threats to our freedoms are coming from. I wish our elected officials recommitted to the oath they took when they were sworn into office. I quote, I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the debt duties of the office of which I'm about to enter, so help me God." And for those of you that aren't brushed, on your, brushed up on your civics, here's the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So, how are we doing? Our world is more interconnected than ever before. It is rather obvious that our own political chaos, supercharged by technology, has enabled, or worse, was perhaps instigated and fueled by outside forces with, which very, with very different ideas and beliefs than our own. Clearly, their objectives are to further destabilize the global order so that they can take advantage of the leadership vacuum this interregnum period offers. Allowing this to happen on our watch while we have been too busy with our own ridiculous infighting is a huge and dangerous mistake. While the global order in the last 25 years or so hasn't been perfect, I feel quite strongly that the alternatives would be horrifying at best. The ideas that our current enemies believe in would result in nothing short of a catastrophe, throwing billions of people into poverty, creating widespread restrictions of freedoms, and ultimately mass deaths. If there ever was a time for our elected officials to turn their attention to the real enemies outside of our borders, it would be now, don't you think? Addressing the other thought around the enemy is us, which I guess is the headline of this post, which is to recognize the war inside of our minds, the enemy within. I did reference the other week that good and evil exists inside all of us. Whether we turn out good or evil simply depends on which one we feed the most. That's why our media is so troubling in general and social media in particular. 
We consume endless clickbait that feeds our worst tendencies and we miss out on nourishing the better angels of our nature. The evil forces out there are experts in misinformation. Their goal is to achieve what they now have achieved, turning ourselves against ourselves. But we must not let them. And it starts with us. We have to reject hate in every form. I can confess to you all that I struggle with this attitude mildly right now. But despite it being hard, I know it is right. So I will do what I always try to do. Practice more, dig deeper, work harder. It takes enormous discipline and commitment to be as clear about our moral convictions and beliefs as we are about our commitment to human decency and compassion is a task that is as difficult as it is important. Here are a few things that inspired me this week. First of all, Rabbi Sharon Brous from Ikar in Los Angeles gave a strong sermon on Shabbat. I thought she navigated this difficult dance between moral clarity and human compassion elegantly. She also inspired those of us, me included, who are flirting with anger, disappointment, and disbelief to call on our be better angels and lead from a position of love. If you prefer reading it, I link to it too. I thought this passage from her sermon was just incredible. It captures so much of how I've felt these past few weeks. Sad, confused, and certainly deeply troubled. And for most of us, she called out this other frightening feeling of loneliness and human disconnection. She said, I quote, We yearn to cast our lot with humanity. We believe that we are too, are all caught up in an inescapable network of humanity. As much as we strive to build self-reliance, we, like all people, hunger to be understood, to be seen in our suffering. Our humble ask is that people give a damn when we die. And it visits an additional anguish on our broken hearts when they do not, end of quote. And she then addressed this feeling of isolation and reminds us that we must not return the favor, meaning we should not treat others the way we are mistreated. She says, I quote, And I ask us to prom promise that this feeling of isolation and loneliness, the yearning for solidarity, will remind us of the sacred responsibility to step closer rather than hide, equivocate, and retreat ourselves when other people are suffering. We who have been excluded by the narrow scope of others' moral concern must not narrow the scope of our moral concern to exclude others. Do you understand what I am saying? Just because others have lost their damn minds, we must not lose our damn minds. End of quote. I needed that. My friend Daniel Lubetsky keeps reminding and inspiring us to not fall into the trap of hate. He insists on having a builders versus destroyers attitude. You can join his new newsletter in a link I've posted. And of course, he's right. And I linked to an interview on the Masters of Scale podcast, which was good, that he made. And also a Zoom call that he held with two strong leaders from both Israel and Palestine. And it's well worth listening to. Particularly hearing our Palestinian friend Ezeldin Masri explain how Palestinians feel is something we all need to take to our hearts. And for some of us, it is certainly not easy to hear. But he does it with compassion and passion, while at the same time denouncing terrorism and what that stands for. We can and must follow that example. What is particularly difficult is who to trust these days. Misinformation is the real weapon of mass destruction. I remain both disappointed and frustrated with both the media and our universities. They have a lot of explaining to do. New York Times in particular is a special case. Every day I find the reporting on the Middle East to be sorely lacking in perspective and context. Barry Weiss uh, wrote a great post about that that I linked to. For those, and many keep asking, who want to hear a clear voice around why this is so devastating, let me point to a couple of interviews. The first was with Mandana Dayani on Morning Joe this week. I think she's super clear. But yes, people accuse her of being biased because she's a Jewish Iranian. I'll contrast her interview with two other voices from the other side. First is a tweet from Hussein 
Abu Bakr Mansour, an Egyptian Middle Eastern peace activist who is laying out the context, I think, in rather clear terms. And second, an interview with the son of the Hamas, one of the Hamas founders, who is discussing this backdrop of this entire war passionately with Pierce Morgan. Here's the bottom line. You can be absolutely concerned and in favor of wanting peace and prosperity for the Palestinian people. I do. And at the same time, be supportive of Israel's right to exist and defend themselves. These are not mutually exclusive propositions. On the contrary, they are both manifestations in support of the kind of liberal democracies and freedoms most of us want for all people. I am hoping that next week I will find space in my soul to cover something different as a welcomed respite from these troubling topics of hatred and war. But I can't promise hate in these troubled times has a penetrating quality which makes it hard to deflect or escape. I guess that's the point of this and last week's post. We must, as hard as it is, because to channel my inner Hillel, if not this, what? And if not now, when? And if not us, who? Have a good week.